So good morning and welcome to Christ Community Church. We are so glad that you are joining with us this morning as we answer God's call to come into worship. As we enter this time, hear this call to worship. Let us worship God, for whom our souls thirst and our bodies long. Listen to me, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. We have come to hear the word God has sent. God's word will not return empty, but will accomplish through us his holy purpose. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Then we will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will sing. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Let us sing together magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. <laughs> Sunday of Lent, we continue letting the words of Psalm 23 guide us. This morning, we hear the reading from the New Century Version. I am reading from the New Century Version. Psalm 23, a song of David. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in green pastures. He leads me to calm water. He gives me new strength. He leads me on paths that are right for the good of his name. Even if I walk through a very dark valley, I will not be afraid, because you are with me. Your rod and your shepherd's staff comfort me. You prepare a meal for me in front of my enemies. You pour oil of blessing on my head. You fill my cup to overflowing. Surely your goodness and love will be with me all my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. We pray that as we continue in this time of worship, that these words might guide how we come into his presence, how we think about our journey with Jesus through Lent, and how our lives continue to deepen in the ways that we rely and trust on our loving God and Father. Our God offers us many blessings, and one of the blessings that we celebrate this morning is that of community, of being able to be gathered together as a body. So we take a moment to reflect on some of the announcements related to our church body. The first is an invitation to join Tal James this Thursday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. He will be hosting another conversation that the Justice and Mercy team arranged. And this month, he will be speaking about the Red Dress Project, about missing and murdered Indigenous women. So we invite you to join us to learn more about that. If you would like to receive the Zoom link, you can contact Eleanor or Lindsay or myself, and we can make sure that you get all the contact information you need for that. So that is this Thursday, March 4 at 7 p.m. We also have just another reminder uh, that if you have not yet, we invite you to submit nominations for elder and deacon. You can find that nomination form on our church website. If you go to the congregation page, there's a form right at the top, and we invite you to be praying about who God is calling to lead our church in these leadership roles in this next season. Because we want to have time to sit in discernment with those who are nominated, but also honor the end of terms for those on our council currently, we're asking that you submit those nominations no later than next Sunday, March 7. If you have any questions or difficulty accessing that nomination form, uh, reach out to myself or Lindsay and we can help make sure that your nomination gets submitted. Also this week is CLASSIS, which is the regional gathering of Christian Reformed churches in BC Southwest. So Elder Sue Cronmiller and myself will be attending that on Zoom. That runs from about lunchtime Tuesday through lunchtime Wednesday. So during that time period, uh, I will be a little slower to respond to emails and voicemails, um, but I will do my best to stay on top of it and get caught up Wednesday afternoon. And we also look forward to bringing back to you news of what is happening in our denomination in British Columbia. As we gather together this morning, we come into God's presence, receiving his blessings, praising his name, but also just dwelling in his presence, bringing before him petitions for our community and our world. So I invite you to join me now in a time of prayer. Let's pray together. Loving God, in whom is housing, shelter, room and board, a place to raise children. We thank you for these four walls and the property lines that define that small portion of creation that is ours to care for. 
We thank you for the lawns and driveways, gardens and porches, sidewalks and streets of our neighborhood, and most of all, for our neighbors. We thank you for the pipes underground that bring clean water, living streams that run into our homes, the pipes underground that carry our waste and the wires overhead, unsightly as they are, that keep us connected to others and to the world. In humility, we have and enjoy more than anyone has any right to expect. We pray for the cracks in our street, the fractures in our body politic, the way we do things that make it difficult, if not impossible, for others, even our own children, who are starting out to dream of what we take for granted as we water the flowers and watch our house values rise. We pray for our own children and others for whom even a small house these days is out of reach financially, that it may as well be a big house. We pray for the single mother who cannot find a two-bedroom apartment she can afford, while, even while holding down two jobs. We pray for the students who graduate into an abyss of debt, we pray for the burdened, for those who carry a backpack of family dysfunction, abuse and addiction, plain bad luck, to use as a pillow under the bridge where they sleep. We could say as we pray our evening prayers that what we have is a gift from the work of our hands and a gift of blessing from you. But this truth doesn't fill in the blanks or vacant lots of inequity and neglect of neighbor, and we know it. So Lord, this morning we ask for hammer and saw. We pray that you would accept us as journey folk, apprentices in your carpentry of compassion. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We are called to heed our neighbor, to love them and to love God. And one of the ways that we are able to express our love to God and to our neighbor is through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. This month, the additional giving opportunity that we have is through our denominational ministry shares a way for Christian Reformed churches to pool their resources so that the little help that each church can offer can be multiplied to serve on a greater scale our brothers and sisters around the world. If you want to give to the denominational ministry shares, you're able to note that on any of the ways that you are submitting your offering. We pray this month in particular that God might bless those funds and that we as a church might proclaim his name locally and globally. We give thanks for the generosity that we continue to see from this church body and praise God for his continued abundance. We do serve a God who loves and blesses, so let us sing together, God so loved.
This morning, along with the psalmist, we claim the truth that the Lord, who is our shepherd, makes us lie down in green pastures, leads us beside still waters, and restores our souls. As we dig deeper into how scripture calls us to live into that truth, that promise, we turn to two, verse, two scripture passages, one in Isaiah and one in Matthew. We turn first to Isaiah chapter 49, and we'll read verses 8 through 12. Isaiah 49. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you. On a day of salvation I have helped you. I have kept you and given you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the ways on all the bare heights, shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them down. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I will turn all my mountains into a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Lo, these shall come from far away, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Syene. We turn now to Matthew chapter 7, sorry, chapter 6, and we'll be reading verses 25 through 33. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the, glass, the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of the Lord, and we give thanks for it this morning. The psalmist declares, he makes me lie down in green pastures. As we conjure up an image of that verse in our heads, it is often one of contentment, one of fields of green as far as we can see. Our emotional connection to that picture might be one of peace and rest, of knowing that all is provided for, that we are in God's care. While that is the image that the psalmist is striving to bring to mind, 
We know that in our own lives, our inner hearts are seldom that still. In this season of Lent in particular, we are called to acknowledge the ways that we fall short of living the way God calls us to live. This year, as we enter a second season of Lent, in a time of restriction, a time of loss, of disease and death, of uncertainty and wondering, a time of longing. We are invited to hear these words anew, to see them as a beautiful promise, but also to hear the challenge in them. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. If we are being honest with ourselves, how much of our lives do we spend worrying? How often do we find ourselves in a space of discomfort and of anxiety? And our greatest desire is to run away from that feeling. To seek to do something, to do anything, to make ourselves feel we have a little bit more control. To come up with a plan of action. To address the fears and anxieties that we acknowledge in our own hearts. And yet, our shepherd makes us lie in green pastures, to be still. Kate Bowler, a Christian author and speaker, in her Lenten reflection this past Thursday, shared this. I don't know whether or not you've noticed but doesn't it seem like the Psalms are making more sense lately? Alongside the well-known praise Psalms, we find plenty that are songs of complaint or lament, full of honest emotion about how bad things feel. Lent is the perfect time for allowing ourselves to stay with reality, to see things clearly, as fragile as they have always been. There is a reason that monks make a vow of stability, a promise to stay in the monastery they have joined rather than go off in search of a better one. And that is because when you stay in one place, you find out your own habitual inner escape route. As my dad likes to remind me, wherever you go, there you are. The words of Isaiah and of Matthew this morning remind us that wherever we go, there we are. And that sometimes where we go is a difficult place to be. Isaiah was prophesying to the Israelites who were in exile, who were not feeling that they were receiving God's greatest gifts, who were out of the homeland that he had given them. Jesus also teaches to Jews who are under Roman rule, a people who again have known what it is to be in the promised land and to lose it. And yet, the call from Scripture today is to be. To trust that God has got it under control. It is natural for us to think of all of the things that we need. To think of what we will eat, what we will drink, what we wear. 
to think about safety and employment, to think about providing for our children and our parents. It is not that we are called to neglect these things, but it's that we are called to trust that God, who created all of creation, who provides for the birds of the air and the plants of the dirt, will also provide for us. That God's provision will be enough to not only satisfy us, but to also make us stand as a testament to the nations. As Isaiah proclaims, God is making us a covenant to the world. That just as God provides for us wherever we go, wherever we are, so he invites all the nations to receive his invitation to be gathered into his flock. God's promises are for all who seek his name, but they're also for us. No matter how long we have been following the way of Jesus, no matter how many years we have called on his name, we know that there are times where we are anxious. We know that there are times that, despite the reminders of creation, we fret about what we have and what we don't have. That even though we are in the midst of green pastures, we wonder, is the grass greener on the other side? Is there more somewhere else? The psalmist doesn't stop at just provision, but he ends this phrase by saying, God restores my soul. This Lenten season, are we expecting enough of God and of ourselves? Are we living into the promise of all that God has offered us? The words of Jesus in Matthew do speak to these physical needs that our God knows that we have. But we are called deeper, further. We're called to move beyond the economics of this world to think of the economics of the kingdom. To worry less and hopefully not at all, about the physical things that we need, trusting to God's provision. But we are called into that trust because God first restores our souls. The reality around us is not always perfect. We know that we have neighbors and family members who do lack clothing, who go hungry, who worry about where they're going to sleep tonight. These words might feel empty when we are confronted with their lack. But we are thinking of the things of this world. And God invites us to think first of his kingdom. We are called to think of all that God offers over the events of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. As we prepare our hearts for that holy week, we prepare by acknowledging the greatness of God's work. 
that all of our sin and brokenness is nailed to the cross alongside Jesus Christ. That while death is the penalty of our sin, we are invited to be resurrected into new life along with Jesus on Easter Sunday. That is what we strive for. To call on Jesus' name, to receive the gift of his grace, to know that by Jesus' death and resurrection, we are offered eternal life in God where there will be no hunger, no sorrow, no death. As we live into that reality, that kingdom reality, the Spirit of God moves us to bring pieces of that kingdom here and now. We are the covenant that God makes with the world. That while Jesus accomplishes grace, through that gift of grace, God invites us to join him in providing for our friends and our neighbors. To help join God in the work of sharing food and clothing of working for just housing systems. And God calls us to join him in the work of restoring our souls, of proclaiming the good news of Jesus, that those who are broken and hurting might meet God's love and grace. We are called as God's children to lay in green pastures, to receive fully all that God is offering us, to trust in his provision. That contentment speaks to those who are seeking those who are wandering. It is a beautiful representation of the way that God cares for us, his children. So this Lent, what are you worrying about? There is much that could make us anxious. But the invitation stands to fast from those things, to give them up to God, to deepen your practices of simply being. As you go through your week, how are you centering yourself in God? Are you allowing yourself to be fully present in where God has placed you? Or is your gaze and your mind wandering to what might be just around the corner, just over the hill, the grass that might be greener elsewhere? The season of Lent we often journey with Jesus as he goes toward Jerusalem. A difficult journey, knowing that death is at the end. And yet, nevertheless, Jesus faithfully sticks to that path. Because Jesus holds to the promises of God. That as Isaiah prophesied, God feeds us along the ways, on heights that look barren to us, God provides, in desert spaces with scorching wind and hot sun, we shall not be overcome. 
because the Lord is our shepherd. The Lord is your shepherd. He knows you by name. He does not neglect to see that you need to eat and you need to drink. God knows all of these things. And our God is a generous and loving God. That even in these seasons of despair, these seasons of illness, Our God has not abandoned us, but has given us the ultimate provision in eternal life through Jesus Christ. Each year we take 40 days to prepare ourselves to fully embrace that Easter message, to truly receive the gift of grace through Jesus Christ. How are you preparing this year? How are you laying where God has placed you? Do you have a practice of gratitude for the good, growing, green pastures God has given you? Are you allowing God to restore your soul? To nourish you? To surround you with his love? Our God is a God of abundance. And all of those things that we worry about, We cannot fix them, but our God can and has. And this morning and every morning, our God desires you to receive his peace from knowing that if you strive after him, if you strive after God's kingdom, then you too can receive the gift of eternal life where every need is met. May this Lenten season be a gift of place, a gift of centeredness in reality where we can acknowledge the difficulties and the brokenness knowing that through it all, our God is with us and offers us his provision. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word to us through the prophet Isaiah and through your son Jesus. God, we know it is not always easy to let go of our worries. But Lord, we pray that your spirit might equip us to lay them at your feet and to leave them there. Lord, we don't deny that this world is still full of brokenness and that at times that makes it difficult for us to cling to your promises. But Lord, we know that what Jesus spoke is true, that you see all of our needs. You know our hearts and our lives, and you, as a gracious and loving Father, meet our needs through the gift of eternal life, through your Son, Jesus. Lord, we pray that the gift, that gift might shape our hearts more and more. That as we lean in to your kingdom, we might find it easier to lean away from our worries. And Lord, we pray 
that we would truly be a covenant to the peoples. That with your power, you might move us to proclaim and glorify your name so that all nations may know your love and your grace. Lord, we pray this all in your, the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have now a reading from the Psalms to help us reflect on the ways that we live into God's promises. Experiencing God, two views, Psalm 13 and Psalm 23. O oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He, le he leads me beside peaceful streams. How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? He restores my soul. He guides me along paths of righteousness for the sake of his good name. How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord, my God. Restore the sight to my eyes, or I will die. Even when I walk through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Don't let my enemies gloat, saying, We have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. You prepare a feast for me right in front of my enemies. You welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he has been so good to me. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Christ calls the bread his body and the cup his blood, or the new covenant in his blood. Christ has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that just as bread and wine nourish the physical life, so too his crucified body and poured out blood are the true food and drink of our souls for eternal life. But more important, he wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, share in his true body and blood as surely as our mouths receive these holy signs in his remembrance that all of his suffering and obedience are as definitely ours as if we had personally suffered and made satisfaction for our sins. Hear the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this covenant. I invite you to repeat after me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray together. With joy we praise you, gracious Father, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us 
even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whose grace we may triumph over temptation, be more fervent in prayer, and be more generous in love. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Amen. Jesus was always the guest. In the homes of Peter and Jairus, Martha and Mary, he was always the guest at the meal tables of the wealthy, where he pled the cause of the poor, he was always the guest. Upsetting polite company, befriending isolated people, welcoming the stranger, he was always the guest. But here, at this table, he is the host. Those who wish to serve him must first be served by him. Those who want to follow him must first be fed by him. Those who would wash his feet must first let him make them clean. For this is the table where God intends us to be nourished. This is the time when Christ can make us new. So come. You who hunger and thirst for a deeper faith, for a better life, for a fairer world. Jesus Christ, who has sat at our tables, now invites us to be guests at his. Congregation of Jesus Christ, the Lord has prepared his table for all who love him and sincerely and trust in him alone for their salvation all who are truly sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who desire to live in obedience to him as Lord, are now invited to come with gladness to the table of the Lord. I invite you to take now your bread. Take, eat, Remember and believe that the body of Christ is the bread of heaven for us. I invite you to take now your cup. Take, drink, remember and believe that the blood of Christ is the cup of our salvation. Jesus is host, who invites us to come to receive nourishment for our bodies, but also for our souls. He sees all that we need, and he offers to be all that we could desire, all that we could need. He seeks to be it all. Let us respond to that gift by singing, You are my all in all. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my Oh, 
invited us to come to his table to receive nourishment both physical and spiritual. Now as God sends us forth to be a covenant to the nations, to proclaim his name to the east and to the west, we receive again his gift as he offers us a parting blessing, which I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit to receive. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord your God and one another.